Welcome everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome today Joseph Ledu. I'm a big fan of his work. He's a neuroscientist, professor of science, professor of neuroscience and psychology at New York University. He published so many hundreds of papers on split brain and a lot on amygdala research. <laughs> and um, I would like to see, started with uh, working with Michael Galzaniga on split brain, which is a um, situation when you have a refractory epilepsy, when you have an epilepsy that does not respond to medications and they try everything and they at last resort, they decide to cut part of the whole corpus callosum and separate the two hemispheres. And I think that's a way you started to understand um, how the unconscious mind can create a story. You want to tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Well, you know, I was um, a brand new graduate student in the 1970s, 1974. I ended up taking a course with a guy who was studying memory in the brain. And you know, I didn't know you could, I was just a young, naive kid from a small town in uh, Louisiana. I didn't know you could study the brain. But this guy was actually studying the brain. And I worked in his lab a little while, and I applied to a lot of graduate schools. And the only place that accepted me was uh, Stony Brook out on Long Island, University of Stony Brook, uh, because a professor there knew my professor. So I went to Stony Brook. I met Mike Gazaniga, uh, Gazaniga, depending on where you are and how you pronounce it. I call him Gazaniga. So Mike Gazaniga and I hit it off very, uh, very nicely at the very beginning. He took me in, even though I had no background in science at all, and let me study patients, split brain patients with him. As you said, these are people in whom the connections between the two hemispheres are, are sectioned surgically in order to help control intractable epilepsy. Now, it's interesting what happens in these patients. I mean, Mike did a lot of studies in uh, um, at Caltech when he was a graduate student a decade before I got involved. And what he discovered in studying these patients was that, you know, the left hemisphere, of course, has language and you can talk to the left hemisphere. The right hemisphere can't talk to you. Uh, so we don't really know what's going on in the right hemisphere very well uh, because it can't have a, a human conversation uh, with you. So just to be clear, usually the language center is on the left side in human. That is why the right side does not that does not have ability to speak because they can they don't have a language center but sometimes they do have it on the right side sometimes they do how often do they, they i mean i've heard even on both sides so you know it's it depends on a lot of things like if you're left-handed sometimes there's more language over there it's been said that uh females have a little more language on the the right side than uh the, than males I mean, I'm talking about information I knew back in the 1970s because I haven't kept up with, with all of this uh, since then. Um, but yeah, so sometimes it's there. And one, one thing that can cause it to be there in, a, in an abundance is brain damage, something like epilepsy in the temporal lobe. So if you've got epilepsy in the left temporal lobe, that can cause a reorganization of language processes in the right hemisphere. You know, you'd Language is a very important thing, and the brain finds a way to be, be plastic and to adapt to brain damage in one side by compensating on the other side. You can put a stimulus into the right hemisphere by presenting it to the left side of space, left visual field. Everything, if you're staring at a spot right in the middle of the screen, everything to the left of that goes to the right hemisphere. Everything to the right goes to the left hemisphere. So it's a way to put information into uh, the right hemisphere. And so you put, let's say, a picture of an orange a fruit into the right hemisphere, and you ask the left hemisphere, what did you see? The left hemisphere says, I didn't see anything because it went to the right hemisphere and there's no communication. But then you present several pictures, an apple, an orange, a banana, and the left hand connected to the right hemisphere points to the orange because that's the picture you presented there. So it's the left hemisphere is awake, alert, responsive to stimuli. Um, but what does that mean? Uh, how do we know if that part of the brain is conscious? Because if it is conscious, we face a very interesting uh, situation. 
Uh, Mike wrote a paper about this in the early 70s before I was involved in his lab called One Brain, Two Minds. So there's maybe two people inside that head. Uh, but there was no way to really test it. Now, when I came along, we happened to be studying a brand new set of patients in uh, New England. We, we weren't interested in so much in what it meant for the split brain patient because that was pretty well understood. What we wanted to know is what it meant for the rest of us. Were there some secrets about what it is to be human that we could learn from these patients? And so we started thinking about different kinds of uh, questions to ask. And it's difficult because the right hemisphere can't talk. So the next question we asked is, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> and he said a race car, he spelled race car driver. Okay. So not only did he have a sense of self, but also an ambition for the future. So those are two qualities that we think of human consciousness having, knowing who you are and anticipating the future and believing uh, that you have a future that you can, you know, that you will live to the future. And understanding that is a very complicated, almost cultural thing, really. You have to have that kind of cultural knowledge to understand all this. Um, so we had also asked the left hemisphere, what do you want to be when you grow up? And so it responds verbally by saying, I want to be an architect. So we had a race car driver on one side, a, an architect on the other side, and but both of them had the same name. So it was like, you know, two personalities with the same name and uh, different ambitions for the future. So it's all fascinating. But I have to emphasize, this is one patient, you know, a couple of little questions that we happen to think of, uh, of asking and getting some interesting results. It's more of a metaphor uh, of how to think about the brain rather than a set of actual hard scientific facts right. with statistics and all of that. But it led us to the conclusion, which is where we wanted to go. And so what does this mean for us? Well, um, we did one study that answered that question. So we put one stimulus in the left visual field and another stimulus in the right visual field simultaneously. Okay. So on the right side was a chicken claw. That's going to the left hemisphere. On the left side is a snow scene going to the right hemisphere. So when you do that, the left hand pops out and points to a shovel, and the right hand points to a, a, a picture of a chicken. So you said, why did you do that? Now you're talking only to the left hemisphere who's going to be, be able to talk to you. It says, well, I saw a, a chicken claw, so I pointed to the chicken. And you need a shovel to clean out the chicken shed. Okay. So he didn't know why he had pointed to the shovel because the right hemisphere had pointed to the shovel. The left hemisphere didn't know why, but yeah. it made up the story, a narration to make its behavior make sense. You know, in France, I don't know, you probably remember Charcot was doing this famous lecture. Yeah. And uh, Sigmund Freud, you know, was assisting to those lectures, and Babinski, who was also a French physician, and he did the same thing because I, I read that, that that study with the, the snow and the, and the chicken claw. He used hypnosis in one of his lectures. You probably read that, and he he gave a post hypnotic uh, a suggestion, and right. Charcot said to the patient, "When I say goodbye, you open your umbrella." Same thing happened. So we talked to the patient and he said goodbye. And in the middle of the amphitheater, the patient opened his umbrella. And when they asked him, why do you open your umbrella? Same thing. He totally gave an interpretation. Oh, my umbrella gets stuck. I have to open it all the time when I'm yeah. in Very, first. very similar. Yeah, very similar. So we all believe we have free will, right? And so when you see your body responding, in a way that you, your conscious mind, didn't generate, that's a challenge to free will. So we, our hypothesis was that what this does, what these challenges do, is create a state of cognitive dissonance. Mike was a good friend of Leon Festinger, the inventor of cognitive dissonance. And so the idea was that behaviors that are produced non-consciously can cause cognitive dissonance. And in order to reduce that dissonance, you need to generate a narrative that makes sense 
And as a result, then you are no longer dissonant. Uh, I, you need a shovel to clean out the chicken shed. It's a narration or an interpretation of why we do what we do, because most of our behavior is generated unconsciously. And as part of being a human being, you have to have a mechanism to take that in stride and make it part of make it part of your narrative, who you are, and why you do what you do. There's people today in some countries that don't like to say, I don't know, if you, if you ask them for a road, for, for yeah. directions, they will not say, I don't know. They will just give you something just, <laughs> just to, uh, <laughs> to get over the, the cognitive dissonance. So practically, we assume there will be conflict. And we see in popular movies, one hand trying to do something, the other hand trying to stop yeah. it. And I, and I know it exists, but I've heard that most of the time, one hemisphere usually overrides the other. And there's not as many conflict as you can expect between an architect and a car uh, racer. So is, is it, the case is, is, yes. is it's correct, right? So the what, what you're talking about is something called the acute disconnection syndrome. This is a temporary phase of about, you know, several weeks, months, where the two hemispheres are competing because now you split the brain in half and what the hell is, you know, that each is like trying to figure out what the other one is doing because they re they recognize that something is going on that, you know, the other is not, you know, I didn't do that. Or uh, even when you don't have a lot of language over there, um, you have learned in a kind of statistical, deep learning way that uh, when some, when X happens verbally, you do why, even though you don't know what it means, you know the rules that when that is happening, that's how you should respond. So the two hemispheres are in competition in the, these early days. And over time, if it's a hemisphere that doesn't have a lot of language, it's very easy for the language hemisphere to dominate. It's almost like the right hemisphere gets depressed or, you know, it, it, it loses. I mean, it, there's no battle it can really win with this dominant speaking left hemisphere that's engaging in the world all the time, all it can do is kind of respond. And so I think it's, you know, metaphorically, it's kind of just, it loses the battle and the, and is reconciled to just be a lesser partner. Yeah. But, you, but, but if you don't have a conscious mind over there, because there's language and, and more cognitive uh, stuff that, that is normally not in the right hemisphere, then it's not really a depressed right hemisphere that's you know thinking about all the problems that uh, it can't do, all the things it can't do. It's just a kind of rote learning that happens uh, that allows it to uh, adapt to the, the present situation. Now, when there are patients that have more language over there, then the, I don't know how, you know, we only saw this patient for uh, a year or two, so I don't know what happened in later life uh, and how this played out in, in this in this young man. Uh, he was about 15 or so when, when I studied him. So, you know, none, it's hard to know what the consequences of all this are psychologically because <clears throat> these people are not quote, you know, typical that you know there's something a little off, but you don't know if that's uh, because uh, their brain was split which you know certainly is a big deal and can have some consequences, or because these people have had epilepsy all their lives yeah. and have never socialized and have no you know external life really. So they're they're kind of doomed to be a bit awkward because um, they just don't have the capacity to interact. The, you know they were many of them were like at home all the time. They would have seizures so bad their parents would have to hold them on the mattress to prevent them from being injured. You know, it was really horrible. <clears throat> Do you know if they cut the optic chiasma or they just took the, just cut, you know, just the cor corpus callosum, right? Well, so it's ish one, one thing that's uh, uh, of interest in that topic is that there are several, so let's say, let's say we've got a hot dog bun and we pull it apart. Do you have a hot dog bun? I have a hot dog bun with me. Okay, so yeah, okay, great. So you pull the, the, the two hemispheres apart, and down there, the white thing is the corpus callosum. So normally that would connect the two sides, uh, but but um, in the case when it's cut, 
it's not going to be connected anymore. But there are other commissures below it, uh, especially the ant that's the corpus callosum. I guess, you sure? you to tell. And then the anterior commissure is that in there in your model? Not okay. Really, yeah. Anterior commissure is down below, and what it does is it connects the temporal lobe on the two sides. Now, and the two amygdala. The temporal lobe is. Is where the amygdala is. That's how I first got interested in the amygdala. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we have. Do you know sorry. the anterior commissure is the first commissure to appear in the embryo, and that's the one connecting the two amygdala. So that's very interesting. And so you have the anterior yeah. commissure, the posterior commissure, the commissure of the fornix. A lot of them are not cut. Let's talk about the amygdala right now. And we saw on this okay. model, um, it would be located. So you have the brain here, brain stem. And in the temporal lobe, those are the temporal lobe right here. The most medial aspect there is called the uncus. And this is our amygdala right there. So it's very, very medial. I see now on the internet a lot of drawing when we, they put the amygdala very, very lateral. And, um, and, and everybody copies those models. So on palpation, it will be located somewhere here. Tell me if I'm wrong. Between the, the end, the tail of the eyebrow and the beginning of the air, usually you feel the amygdala somewhere here if you know how to palpate. And I'm going to show you in one second some photo that so, some of them, you give them to me, Joseph. So here, okay, so we have this amygdala in red. Look how medially connected they are, this part of the temporal lobe. So this is a big area. This is a frontal cut, go like this. You see them here, one side. This is a, the, the drawing when I see the, I see them more and more lateral in the brain. And so you can see the amygdala is, is in green. You have the hippocampus. Amygdala is located anterior, superior, a little bit medial sometime to the um, hippocampus. And this is now your specialization, all the subregion. How many subregion we, we know now in the uh, amygdala? Uh, the, the, you know, it depends on whether you count the sub sub regions or the sub regions. You know, it's like there are lots of uh, different parts, but you, you know, you can say there's probably a dozen different areas or so. Yeah, I've heard 20, 30 it seems so much for me. Now, uh, I got interested in the middle, as I said, from that split brain patient, but then that's what led me to be to begin doing research on the amygdala uh, in rats. Now, you're looking at the human amygdala here, so we have a lot of different parts. So that's uh, a dissection let's, let's on, on the right side. This is actually the hippocampus, but in front of that, again, frontal cut, you have the brain stem here, you have the cortex within the cortex, the insula, and then you have the amygdala right in the this is a temporal lobe. It's right there. I just mm -hmm. the, the left, so very important. I know you don't like to use the word uh fear circuit for the amygdala. You really want to describe it as a defensive survival circuit. So you want to talk yeah. about that because you feel like a lot of people um, misinterpret your, your results and your data. I think it's right. important. Yeah. So, you know, <clears throat> I came into the amygdala from the split brain work with a specific question. How does the amygdala unconsciously control behaviors, emotional behaviors that in a human, because we, because we have an amygdala and animals have an amygdala, mammals have an amygdala, all vertebrates have an amygdala. The question is, when we talk about that, what are we talking about? So my perspective from the beginning was I was thinking of the amygdala as an unconscious detector of danger that would produce behavioral responses like uh, freezing and so forth to protect the animal. So at the time, in the field of memory, the distinction between implicit memory and explicit memory was very popular. So I tried to use that distinction to talk about the amygdala. The amygdala was an implicit processor of fear. I called it implicit fear. And the cognitive interpretation was a kind of prefrontal explicit process of fear that allows you to experience the fear. The implicit explicit distinction didn't hold in, in emotion research the way it did in, in, uh, in memory. But I got, kept being introduced over the years at lectures as someone who had discovered how the amygdala gives us our feelings of fear. 
And, you know, at first I didn't care. I was young. I was just interested in collecting the data and understanding, okay, we'll call it implicit fear. But the, the amygdala became this very popular fear center. The amygdala is the brain's fear center. You could hear that. You put that into Google and get a million hits, the amygdala fear center. And so I felt it was wrong and I needed to both clarify my position and, and uh, also clarify it for the field because I thought it was wrong to call the amygdala fear center because we're getting money from NIH and IMH to study these responses because people think that it's going to make them less fearful or anxious. But that's not what the amygdala does. The amygdala will, if you have a drug that changes the amygdala, it's going to be much better at changing behavioral and physiological responses than in changing the subjective experience of the person. Feeling of fear, yes. Subjective. Feeling of fear. People go to therapists because they want to feel less fearful and less anxious. They might want to change their, you know, their freezing and their hyper arousal and so forth. Why not? Yeah, that's important. Um, but if they leave therapy and are still feeling fearful or anxious, it hasn't worked. But NIH is pushing the idea that we can change fear in the amygdala. You know, we can find a pill that you can take. It will go into your gut, be digested, distributed throughout your entire body, find its way to your brain, and find this a magic fear center, turn that off, and all of a sudden, everything's going to be great. Yes. But that's not how it works. It doesn't do that. What you study is a behavior of rats. You don't know what their feelings are, basically. Right. And they so, develop the drugs using rats and mice. So fear is when the danger is present right now, at this moment. Anxiety is when the threat did not happen yet, is not... There's not a specific danger right now, right? Right, it's in the future. Yeah. And so if we, if we've, you know, it doesn't have all of the, the nuclei, but these are the, the various um, connections that I discovered. Um, I discovered some of these and other people discovered others. But um, uh, when I turned to rats, you know, after studying split brain patients, I decided I wanted to understand the, uh, that em how emotion systems in the brain might be generating behaviors unconsciously that would require these conscious narrations and interpretations uh, that we were seeing. So that's why I turned to studies of rats. And my emphasis was on how does information get to the amygdala? Uh, some of the outputs of the amygdala, from the, if you go to the central nucleus of the amygdala at the bottom, CEA, that's the output structure. Uh, one pathway goes to the central gray to control defensive behaviors like freezing. Another goes to the lateral hypothalamus to control the sympathetic nervous system. Another goes to the uh, dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, directly from the central amygdala, to control the parasympathetic system. And another goes to the paraventricular hypothalamus to control the pituitary and the release of ACTH and, uh, from the pituitary and cortisol from the, from the uh, adrenal gland. Um, but the central amygdala also activates arousal networks in the brain and releases norepinephrine, dopamine, acetylcholine, serotonin, and other chemicals. It's a very important output uh, that um, um, is, you know, it's an output structure that's controlling all these consequences, these effectors. But the lateral nucleus is where a lot of my work took place because I was interested in how information gets into the amygdala. That was less known than, than uh, the output stuff. I mean, I studied all these output pathways too, but the, the lateral amygdala was my kind of, my, my best friend thing I really wanted to understand best. Um, and so we discovered that for the, the first time that there were sensory inputs that directly go from the thalamus to the lateral amygdala. That was a big deal because uh, before that, it was thought that if you're involved in any kind of sensory processing in the brain, it had to go through the sensory cortex and then go to the amygdala or then go to the hippocampus and so forth. But what we were showing here was that you could actually get a stimulus to the amygdala and start controlling the central amygdala from the lateral before you actually got it to the cortex or about the same time that it reached the cortex. Before consciousness. So, so that's what you describe it, the slow way and the fast way. And I've heard yeah. that, I don't know if it's correct. It's about to go the slow way is about eight, to go through consciousness. It's 800 times slower than to go uh, 
if that is too much, no? Uh, no. So uh, let's let's just talk about this a bit because this is uh, something that got confused a lot. Okay. So the low road is from the thalamus to the lateral amygdala. The high road is from the sensory cortex to the lateral amygdala. Both of those are unconscious pathways. Ah, okay. The high road, I mean, the, the sensory cortex also goes to the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus and so forth and allows you to then create a conscious experience of the sensory information. And that pathway is very slow. But the sensory thalamus, let's take it in terms of auditory stimuli because that's what I studied most. It takes about seven milliseconds, like a, take a, a second, divide into a thousand parts. The first seven thousandths, are get the sound is getting to the amygdala. It takes twice as long for that information to get to the amygdala from the cortex. You say, oh, well, it's just a few milliseconds. But from you know, the you, cortex, you mean the sensory cortex? Or sensory that? cortex to the lateral amygdala. So it, it's just a few milliseconds, like seven right. or eight milliseconds different, getting from thalamus or sensory cortex to the amygdala. But the brain is ticking. The brain keeps time in terms of milliseconds and microseconds our mind takes place in seconds, right? We think like over periods of seconds rather than milliseconds, you know, 500 milliseconds to a thousand or so. so but it's, it's longer. How long it takes to go from the stimulus to become conscious? But, so, I don't, you know, I'm not sure how long it, okay. what the, what the, the actual delay into higher order cortex would be, but I would think it would be several times more because when you're taking a sensory stimulus to let's say you want to get a sensory stimulus into the prefrontal cortex. That can happen relatively quickly, but a sensory stimulus on its own, say a visual or auditory stimulus is meaningless until it's first integrated with memory, right? You have to, com you have to combine some semantic memory with the stimulus in order for that stimulus to be meaningful. So that means it's got to go to the you know, medial temporal lobe and the hippocampus uh, retrieve semantic memories in the temporal lobe. And that combined representation of sensation and memory is a perceptual stimulus now that can go to the higher order cortex. But that's, you know, we've added a lot of time adding memory to the sensation. Joseph, so when you have a threat stimulus, the reticular lamp system and, and, and you know, the pituitary, they receive only after the stimulus has been integrated. That's the first... Well, Place to recover. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay. For the most part, yes. But you know, let's say it's a touch stimulus, or you know, a, 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 a nociceptive stimulus, a pain stimulus. Somehow, there are collateral pathways that will take information into, for example, the periaqueductal gray, the central gray, directly. Um, it's not going to be very meaningful information, but it, it will be sensory information that can go there. So you can uh, froze just because of the periaqueductal gray matter in the midbrain. Right. You can froze directly without your amygdala. And that might prime the, the, the periaqueductal gray to now receive a stimulus that has been processed more thoroughly and meaningfully in the central lateral and central amygdala. And now it's ready because it's got that priming um, to, to trigger it, right? So central gray, but also right above the central gray uh, is the superior colliculus. And there's a lot of work showing that stimulation of the superior colliculus can trigger freezing and, and flight behaviors and so forth. And it's a circuit that light really blends with the uh, periaqueductal central gray area. So all of those, those subcortical areas can have these sensory in inputs. But it's not until you get into the forebrain that you have more meaningful kinds of stimuli that have been integrated through Pavlovian conditioning uh, in the lateral amygdala and central amygdala, or that have been integrated by um, the semantic and episodic memory uh, in higher order cortex and hippocampus in higher order cortex, um, that the information comes back down. And so each, each step is a loop, right? So you can go from the sensory system to the central gray, from the sensory system to the amygdala and back to the central gray, from the sensory system to the cortex, back to the amygdala and then back to the central gray. So there are lots of loops mm -hmm. that are preparing the brain in a very primitive way to get the circuit going and then to add more information from 
associative learning, Pavlovian learning that can trigger it, but also to add meaningful information that could add more content to what is being triggered. That's great. So do you have a um, larger amygdala on male and like we have in human? Right. So unfortunately, the <clears throat> uh, research on rats and other um, non-human animals has mostly been done on uh, on males. This is what an oversight in the in the research program. It was done out of convenience because you know you double the cost of any study by adding a female set of groups, mm -hmm. and then then you uh, then there, there there is the issue of do you allow do you figure in the estrus cycle as uh, a major factor in, and when to test the animal test the female. Right, right. Animal. So you're you're adding a lot of groups. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it, and you now have to do it. Uh, it's a a requirement, which is good. It's a requirement for federal funding of these grants to have um, you know gender balance in the research design, unless you can have some. I don't know what what the excuse would be, but what what would be a uh, a legitimate excuse for not doing it? But you have androgen receptors. In the amygdala, right? So you, you know, it's going yeah. to, be, yeah, it's going to. Um, so it's complicated uh, because the NIH requires you to include females, but it doesn't give you extra money to test females. Mm -hmm. So you get the same grant, but you have to have more number, more animal numbers in it. So it's, it's in a way, it. Um, uh, I mean, it's it's incredibly important that we do it, but I'm not sure we've come up with the right strategy for achieving it. What about the hemisphere specialization, left and right amygdala, the difference between the left and the right to get some... Good, in animals? In animals or in human? What's oh, right? in humans. Okay, yeah. So that in humans, it's a good question in, in both cases, but in humans, it's most important because... You know, there are, we, in the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of talk about uh, left brain, right brain, right? That some people are left brain, some people are right brain. Well, actually, what it meant was that some people uh, use language more and some people use spatial right. ability. But that doesn't mean it's the whole left brain and whole right brain that are doing that. That, I mean, language has taken over parts of the left hemisphere, but I, th I think it's wrong to think of hemispheres as doing anything. You know, we've got all this circuitry in this picture here that you just showed. Yeah. Um, yeah. That that it's not it's not the amygdala that's doing anything alone, right? It's it's working with all those other areas to achieve its goals and to do what it's going to do. Um, so, in a way, it's wrong to say the amygdala does X. Uh, for one thing, the amygdala does a lot of things. It's involved in, you know, sexual behavior, maternal behavior, aggressive behavior, uh, so you know, social interactions. Beliefs. I've heard some parties for beliefs, uh, spiritual experiences, and beliefs. Certainly, there's a lot of stuff going on. So it's wrong to say the amygdala is a fear center, right? That's wrong. Um, it's even wrong to say the amygdala is a threat center, because it's doing a lot of other stuff. So what? is what is going on is you have circuits within the amygdala that involve perhaps neurons in the same area that are doing different things because they're having different inputs and outputs. So you could have the same neurons. I've heard some some of the neurons, for example, could respond to aggressivity and sexuality at the same time. That's right. why we make up sex is because aggressivity can stimulate sexuality. <laughs> yeah, but even without, without like getting into uh, psychoanalyzing the amygdala, yeah. so we <laughs> The fact that the two neuron, two the same neuron, could have an input from say, some sensory system about uh, aggression and an input from sex may have nothing to do with the output because the same neuron. It's okay. really not the neuron; it's the synapses, right? Yeah. So the synapses are coming to the same neuron, uh, but that neuron is now sending different outputs to other areas because that neuron is getting thousands of inputs oh, right. and so it's really not one or the other it's like it's getting a lot of information and it's sending out a lot of information so even though we can trace a pathway for aggression or for sex through those circuits uh, we don't 
that doesn't mean that that neuron is is uh, doing both things in a sense, you know, right, because right, right. it's sense. really the yeah. the mesh of what comes in and what goes out. It's like a circuit board. Something is coming in, and some of those inputs are are going in one direction, and others are going in another direction as they go out. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, and when the amygdala appears in animals, is it um, the lizard already have an amygdala, and you know, in the phylogeny? When oh, oh, I'm sorry. Amygdala. Okay, yes. Uh, yeah. All right, so <clears throat> all vertebrates have an amygdala or a set of genes in primitive areas that can be traced through from the earliest fish into the human amygdala. So there's a set of genes that are uh, can be traced into more advanced fish, bony fish, for example, uh, from fish to amphibians, amphibians uh, <clears throat> to reptiles and mammals. So the amygdala is there in some form in all vertebrates. But after that, let, let's say, let's say we're talking about a threat circuitry. So you can find traces of the threat circuitry throughout all vertebrates related to those genes. But when you go to flies and bees and, and other things, um, it's a different set, it's it's a different brain, right? All vertebrates have a vertebrate brain. So about 630 million years ago, there was a flatworm that was the most advanced creature on Earth. Um, and it had a brain and it had a nervous system, a, you know, a, a nerve cord that goes back kind of like a spinal cord, but it was just a nerve cord. And that flatworm um, diverged. In other words, its descendants diverged over a long period of time so that by around... I don't know, 500 and something million years ago, one set of divergences was to what's called protostomes. Now, protostomes are animals in which the mouth opens first and the anus opens second in early development, in the embryonic development. Now, the reason that's important because they are an entire line, all of the invertebrates that, that we know about you know, from octopus and jellyfish, not sorry, jellyfish, yeah. octopus, um, uh, crabs, all the crustaceans, uh, flies, bees, all the insects, uh, arachnoids, spiders, and so forth. All of those invertebrates are outputs of that protostome. I'm uh, sorry, that, that, that flatworm. So these are the protostomes. And then the deuterostomes are the line that led to the vertebrates. Now, there's an invertebrate set of deuterostomes that are a link between the flatworm and vertebrates. The protostomes came directly, but there's a, an invertebrate link. The protostomes never got past being invertebrates, right? The one with a notochord, right? The, the one that? with a notochord, they don't have vertebrae, they have notochord. Okay, right, yes. So that those all, all of these that came out, all of these deuterostomes, after a certain point, became chordates. And the chordates, they were at first, uh, not, they had a, a, a brain um, and they had a, a cord, but they didn't have a, a vert, vertebral cord. They didn't have a spinal column. So uh, with the arrival of the vertebrates, the first fish, we began to have the spinal column and a brain encased in a, in a skull and so forth. Now, even in the first fish, the spinal column is not bone. It was made out of cartilage. Uh, and so, you know, sharks branched out from that and so forth. And then the bony fish came along later. And the fish we tend to, you know, eat in the supermarket and stuff and, are the bony fish. We don't uh, have too much of the others, but there's some that, that, that make it in. Um, and so, yeah, so all of the vertebrates have an amygdala because that's their ancestry. But the other animals have some threat circuit in their nervous system because they have to detect and respond to danger, but it's not an amygdala. So um, what's interesting for me is when you, the, when the amygdala decide there is a threat, where this non-conscious labeling narration comes from? Okay. Okay. 
Now we're getting into the details. So, okay. <laughs> uh, first of all, I don't think the amygdala literally decides. The, the Its neurons detect what it's learned. It detects. Uh -huh. It's undergone plasticity. So that a sound in the world or a picture or the face of someone has been connected to the aversive consequences of seeing that face. So a mugger is about to hit you. So you remember the face. Next time you see that face in the lineup at the you know police station, your heart beats fast and your amygdala is activated. And, you know all that happens. So um, the narration is in my mind. So the the behavioral and physiological responses to danger are one consequence of the detect of the of the danger coming into the brain, right? So the danger comes into the brain, it goes to the low road and the high road, the, in other words, sensory thalamus, sensory cortex, activates the amygdala in both cases and begins to produce freezing, escape, whatever, and your heart is beating faster. At the same time, the same stimulus in the outside world is going from the sensory cortex into the temporal lobe, into the hippocampus and other temporal lobe memory processing errors, it's turning that stimulus into a meaningful perception, something with, with um, psychological content. It's a danger signal, right? It's, it's danger in the semantic sense. You but know- that, We're still unconscious here. It was, yes, it's still unconscious it's because uh, they, memory and sensation are, are integrated unconsciously. The, now you got have a, a memory representation going to the prefrontal cortex. But at the same time, the hippocampus and other areas of the temporal lobe are sending memory information into the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which is where schema are assembled. Extension. Schema are complex memories about scenarios, about situations. So you now have a scenario, a scene, a, a schema, a scenario about danger and about your relationship to danger and how you would like to respond to danger, how you would, how other people respond to danger, what's going to happen in this dangerous situation. All of that information is compressed into that schema because you've acquired that information over the course of your life, this semantic and episodic memory. It's programmed. It's already pro unconsciously programmed. Well, it's it's assembled as a, yeah. a body of knowledge, you know, the, and so it's unconscious in this to the extent that I say, what did you have for breakfast this morning? You weren't thinking about that, but as soon as I ask you, you, you know what it is and you can tell me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the schema, first of all, you had to like you call up the schema of breakfast and you, you know, you, you put together all the things you could have had, and eliminate those and come up with the one you had. So it had, schema have all this information about situations. So in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, that scheme is assembled. And that schema then becomes the basis for a mental model, an unconscious mental model in the prefrontal cortex in working memory that is now the uh, integrating other cortical information so that what comes out of that model is a non-conscious narrative, right? That will now go to your speech center so that you can talk about that non-conscious narrative consciously. You talk about it, it's not conscious, it's all unconscious. Right? So you can talk about it and you can act on it. So that those are two outputs of the narrative. One is to speech, one is to action, and the third is to consciousness. So now you're conscious of the, the narrative. And from the conscious narrative, you can also talk about it and acting consciously. So you've got non-conscious speech and action. Now, I think this is why consciousness is so complicated. Because we never know, as scientists, whether we're, we're measuring the unconscious narrative, I'm sorry, the unconscious speech or the conscious speech, and the unconscious behavioral response or the conscious behavioral response, because there are pa different pathways. The brain is complicated. And you can say, oh, my God, that's too complicated. We'll never figure it out. But the secret is, you know, as I forget who the author of uh, um, uh, The Art of War was, the Japanese uh, book, The Art of War. The, he said, you know, you have to know your enemy, right? So if you know these that you have these two things going on, consciously and unconsciously, 
then you can build it into your model as a feature rather than having it as an impediment. You know, if we know what the parameters are. The lapse of time is more than 500 milliseconds between unconscious and consciousness. There's this lapse, or they always talk about this 500 millisecond. When a lot of things happen, you are not conscious, and then you come to consciousness, but it's just a memory. Thanks so much, Joseph. I don't want to take all your time. It was so enlightening. I absolutely love that information. Hope you can have a great pre-retirement with N. Well, <laughs> thank you.